buckle up. Well, I've already done one of these. It's going to be real. <laughs> Psalm chapter 2. Open your Bible to Psalm chapter 2. We're in week 2, if uh, you're just joining us, of a sermon series entitled Kings of the Earth. Kings of the Earth. And it comes from Psalm 2. That's a line in Psalm 2. But this sermon series um, is born out of my own experience as uh, an American Christian in the 21st century in what feels to me to be one of the most tense, polarized, divided periods of my experience as an American and as a Christian. People that I love on both sides of the aisle uh, having debates and dialogues, and it's gotten ugly uh, in conversations that I've witnessed and experienced, been a part of. Um, There's a lot of uh, unclarity and uncertainty and um, a lot on the line for a lot of different people and for a lot of different reasons. And so, you know, we've been engaged in the political process. If you've, I don't know how many times you voted. Some of you are voting for your first time this election cycle. Some of you have voted three, four, five, six, seven, eight times in presidential elections. Uh, I don't know if that's even humanly possible, Uh, but we're engaging. And um, so this series though is not a turn where Christ Church is becoming political, jumping on a bandwagon, pushing a party, Uh, We're not trying to do anything like that, Um, but I do want to see every single Jesus follower who's a part of our Christchurch family or followership to really think about and engage with the opportunity you have as an American of age to vote in the election cycle. Um, This this passage in Psalm 2 calls uh, out the kings of the earth, and do you know that in a government of the people, by the people, for the people, when you have an opportunity to vote, you become one of the kings or queens of the earth. This is your chance to utilize the power that's been entrusted to your care. And so I want you to think seriously about it, and I want to I wanna urge you to consider voting. Unless, unless your conscience keeps you from voting, I didn't know that was a thing until recently, but people I know respect and love uh, are conscience born not to vote for specific reasons. And if that's you, I'm not asking you to go against your own conscience. But for the majority of us, this is an opportunity for us to exercise what we know to be true about God and uh, serve for the better outcome for our country as we understand it. And so as you do that, I want us to take some time to look to the scriptures to fill out the categories and topics of justice, liberty, and equality. Uh, These are obviously American virtues, but they were God's virtues before they were American virtues. Do you know it? And so we're going to look at uh, liberty and equality this morning. We're going to look at justice. And I snuck in an early one. Uh, Last week, we talked about religion, not one that you would expect to find with the other three. Um, But I just wanted to point out the fallacy that somehow the public square is neutral and meant to be religion-free. While we do benefit from, and I I will convince you that we benefit from, the separation of powers of church and state, um, we bring our religious impulse, our morality, our understanding of justice um, to the table when we go into the public square, whether that's a Facebook comment stream or whether that is a debate or whether that is the voting booth. Um, The public square is not neutral. It is the battleground of the gods. We as Christians We wear our God on our sleeve, and we have a a proclaimed faith, but every person that engages politically uh, has something that is at the center of their being, their passion, their zeal, and that is the thing they worship. And so this is why these discussions get so heated and become so important and so passionate. And so we sought to look last week at the heart as the initial battleground of the gods and the public square as the battleground of the gods. And so this morning, we're going to move on to the first of these three terms, justice, liberty, and equality. And to do so, we are going to jump into Psalm chapter 2. So let's read it together. Psalm 2, verses 1 to 12. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. 
and you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. God, we ask your rich blessing on your word, which has been read in our hearing. May its uh, timeless truth be written on our hearts. May it change the way we think and alter the course of our lives. God, I pray that your word would have its way in us. God, you tell us that it's alive and active, that it discerns to the heart and motive of mankind. And God, we pray that you would align our motive with your own. Lord, for every person in this place, in my hearing, who's a follower of Jesus, God, I pray that we would hear the voice of our Savior King directing us. And Lord, for every person that does not know you and have saving faith in your name, God, I pray they would hear your voice calling them to the gift of your grace through repentance and faith. Lord, do what only you can do in our hearts and minds as we turn our attention to your word. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. So we're talking about justice. Um, I've seen justice in the news quite a bit. I also see it in the movie theaters, the Justice League. Justice is a, a theme that we're all familiar with. It's part of the human experience. I've never been much for superhero movies, confession. Uh, I know I'm in the minority, but when I, was, when I was a kid, superheroes were simple. We had Batman, Superman, Spider-Man. Now they're like coming from every angle and converging and becoming armies of it's overlapping plot line. I can't even keep up at this point, so I don't even try. Um, but he, the thing about like a fiction and good guy, bad guy type of fiction is that it draws for us very clear lines of justice. When you watch superhero movies, there's an obvious bad guy and there's an obvious good guy and there's always people caught in the middle but the right and wrong is so clear. And what needs to happen is so clear. And I know there's been, you know, alterations to this model. But even I grew up on Star Wars. Anybody grow up on Star Wars? You have the dark side and the light side, you know? It's pretty obvious who the bad guys are. And it lends to an us and them mentality. And it plays off of our own sense of internal justice, which every single one of us have. Now, you especially have it if you are the oldest of many children. Got any oldest in the room? How many of you guys are? Yeah, so you know what it's like to be the oldest. There's something that is uh, just enraging about watching the evolution of your own parents, isn't it? You know what I'm talking about? You know the oldest? I had one friend who used to call his oldest his first pancake. <laughs> you know, like when you're making pancakes and you like make the batter and you turn the skillet on and then you pour the batter in, and the pan wasn't hot, and then you go to flip it, and it kind of slides over, and then you flip it, and you turn it up because it's not cooked, and then you burn the other side, and you get this like half burn, slid together looking pancake, and then the question is, do I eat it or throw it away? <laughs> and then of course the lumps, you're like, oh, I gotta look at the lumps, and then by the time you make your next pancakes, you're like making these beautiful, perfect, golden little round pancakes. <laughs> this is every firstborn child's experience, by the way, in case you didn't know that. Here we are. So, and God helped the parents that started young. Man, some of us had kids when we were still kids and uh, just trying to figure out how to help them make it in life and half of it's trial and error. And so, you know, as old as children, you get to watch your parents change and chill out and loosen up a little bit. And there's this sense of like rage sometimes <laughs> that comes over oldest children when I can't believe you would let them watch that. You never let me watch that. Anybody? Right? Now, some of you are like the second and third and fourth siblings, and you're like, oh, I know that. I know what you're talking about now. I just thought they were crazy. Right? What's wrong with my older sister? She is a nut. I tell you what, it's justice. It's justice. It's the part uh, of you that when someone flies past you in traffic, and then you see them pulled over up the road, you just feel just a certain satisfaction. Right? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? So, so all of us have this like internal sense of, of right and wrong and what, when things are fair. Uh, and yet, and yet, unfortunately, most of our perspective of what's right and what's just really is based on uh, our angle and our experience. Do you know that? 
It's, it's very hard to see injustice um, that isn't from your angle. And we live in a world that's continued to polarize in a way that we're not working hard to see the world from anybody else's perspective. Now you add to that the fact that the most common and often most appropriate response to injustice is anger. Notice the passage begins, why do the nations rage? The reason that the common and most appropriate often response to injustice is anger, it actually mutes our ability to have meaningful conversation and understand one another. Because very quickly, our discussions over perceived injustice from two different angles becomes uh, kind of amplified by clamor and passion and anger and sometimes rage. I don't know if you've experienced this in one-on-one -on -one conversation with people, but certainly through debates and news cycles and interviews, definitely online as people are bantering back and forth and attacking one another. And so we're in, we're in, this, we're in this season of humanity where it's just, gotten, it's just gotten thick, hasn't it? And sometimes it can be really hard to figure out how to pull it apart. And where do you start? How do you start the discussion? Well, I don't want to back off just because it's hard. Amen? I don't want us to sideline something that's complicated because uh, it's important. Let's, let's start with the definition of justice. Instead of using our experience, let's use a dictionary. Justice is that quality of being just. Righteousness, equitableness, or moral rightness. And so within the topic, in the word justice, in its definition is rightness. To uphold the justice of a cause, rightfulness or lawfulness as of a claim or title, justness of ground or reason, to complain with justice, the moral principle determining just conduct. Just like it is with children evaluating their parents' fairness, justice really is about what is fair. And fairness is about impartiality. This is something that's going to come up in the weeks ahead as well. It's impartial and just treatment or behavior without favoritism or discrimination. And our world is filled with injustice. Do you know this? There's the injustice that you can see from your angle, and there's the injustice that you cannot see from your angle. But it is part of the human experience uh, to, to experience injustice, and it is a normal, common, and sometimes appropriate response to be angry. And you actually see this in the Bible. Um, Jesus cleansing the temple comes to mind. And so here we have angry Jesus, now, we often associate anger as a, with a negative connotation. And when you lose control and you yell and scream and call names or you hit someone or hurt somebody or key their car, uh, that's not a good thing. Uh, I'm not talking about the things you do when you're angry. I'm talking about the, the sentiment of anger. Now, oftentimes, anger is also a secondary emotion that's a response to something like fear or, or shame. And so anger isn't always good, but when anger is response to injustice, it's appropriate. And oftentimes, it's the anger that's in people's voice that immediately stops the conversation. And we, as the people of Jesus, need to be the ones who can recognize anger that's connected to injustice and not be distracted or begin to attack somebody's passion over an issue. And so this is a high calling. And I'm asking you, if you call Christ Church home, be willing to engage with angry people. You might find that their anger is actually rooted in an injustice. And if we're seeking to bring God's justice into the world, we might need to get past their anger to the source of their injustice. But back to Jesus. Mark chapter 11, they came to Jerusalem and Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons, not allowing anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, it is not written, is it not written, my house shall be, a, shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So Jesus is identifying something that's wrong. It's not right. There's an injustice. Notice the sale of pigeons. This would have been the sacrifice that only poor people could make. And so here you have people raising the price on the poorest people. They can't afford a lamb, so they're buying birds, and they're coming to buy their birds, and there's no other place to buy the birds now that they're this close to the temple, and they're being raked. And Jesus is ticked. 
Now, before you envision Jesus losing it and throwing over furniture in a fit of rage and then coming to his senses like one of us may, one of the gospels actually says, and Jesus made a whip. That is not something that can be done quickly. Do you you know that? And so here you have the picture of Jesus coming into the temple, seeing injustice, seeing people prey upon the poor and take advantage of those who are coming to bring offerings to God. And this is supposed to be a people where the nations can come and experience the power and presence of God and they're being taken advantage of. And so he perceives an injustice and he has the right response, anger. But what does he do? He makes a very calculated course. Can you imagine Jesus sitting on the steps teaching his disciples and he pulls out a you know, several pieces of leather and starts braiding them together. You know, anytime a preacher picks up a prop, you're like, where's he going with this? You ever have a preacher walk out and he's holding the cabbage? I'm like, ah, what's he gonna do with the cabbage? You know, this is one of those let us verses, isn't it, right? I don't know. Oh, hey, oh, come on, hey. Harsh crowd this morning, that's all right. And so here's Jesus teaching and he's making a whip. And then he uses it. You imagine how... Everybody felt. Now, there's never been a person on the planet as righteous and just as Jesus. And so every move of his should matter to us. And every word of the scripture ought to inform our sense of right and wrong. It really ought to inform our sense of justice. And really, all of us ought to be working towards understanding the world from God's perspective. One of the features of Psalm 2 that maybe you clued in on as I read it was there's several references to God as angry, being filled with fury and wrath. And there's a lot of impulse in modern evangelicalism uh, to to, um, write God as not angry. In fact, there used to be a billboard on I-4 that said, God is not angry. And when I read that, I think, you don't know my God. (laughs) Uh, Because he is angry. Uh, He's just absolved his anger towards us if we have turned to him in repentance and faith. He has no anger left for us. We are his children. Uh, His anger is satisfied in the person of his son, Jesus. He has no wrath and no fury for you. So it could say God is not angry anymore. Um, But when God looks at an unjust world, he has the same response we, we have. We're made in his image, and he's angry. When he looks at the way the kings of the earth are mistreating their subjects, he's angry. When he looks at the laws that are made and enforced that are outside of the realm of righteous, he is angry. And so it is part of the nature and character of God to experience anger. But God is also, he tells us, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He does not always chide, and yet he always works to bring people back to himself. And so God doesn't lose it on people. He's very purposeful about what he does with his anger. And so we see this come to a culmination in final judgment, and that is what these passages are referring to. And in the meantime, God has not just uh, threatened final judgment and told everybody to make smart choices. No, he says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. God has acted for the good of humanity, and he has established a just and righteous king. Isn't that amazing? Now, oftentimes our anger exists beneath the surface. There's a word for that as well, indignation. Somebody say indignation. Indignation. You guys know what indignation looks like, don't you? There should be an emoji for that. Maybe there is. We can put that in the chat. Here's the indignation emoji. This is a phrase, a word that's used in scriptures again and again. When uh, Jesus came in on the donkey as he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, we celebrate, and the children began to cry out, Hosanna! Hosanna to the son of David. What does it say about the Pharisees? They were indignant. How can you let them worship you and welcome you as king? How can you do that? You see, they're angry because they didn't know who Jesus was. They had a misperception and they interpreted it as a misuse of Jesus' role and an injustice. You know, when um, James and John came to Jesus privately and asked to be seated at the seats of power, his right and his left, it says when the other 10 found out they were indignant. They were like, you, you guys, I oh, cannot believe you would do that. You sneaky, wily little things, always looking for the leg up on everybody else. But we're also told that Jesus was indignant from time to time. I love this in Luke 13. The ruler of the synagogue 
indignant at this point because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which the work ought to be done. See that ought language, right and wrong? Come on those days and be healed, not on the Sabbath. And so instead of addressing Jesus, he starts telling all the people, go away, get healed tomorrow. Not the right day for healing. And the text doesn't tell us Jesus is indignant, but he is angry. Look at the answer in verse 15. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? That's a mic drop Jesus right there. (laughs) You're going to give your donkey water And then you're going to tell this woman she can't be healed on the Sabbath? You see Jesus? They're wrong. They're mad. They're indignant. But they're wrong. And this is a really important point, especially if you're here and you're under 30. Because there's this like modern misconception that the madder you are, the more right you are. (laughs) Have you guys noticed this at all? I'm like, can we have an honest conversation about the topic? No! (laughs) You're stupid. And your perspective is stupid. And it's almost like the more mad you get, the more right you feel. That is stupid. (laughs) Think about this for a second. Being mad does not make you right. Case in point, Luke 13. The, the, The teachers, the rulers of the synagogue were mad, but they were wrong. And what was the response? Jesus said these things. All his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at the glorious things that were done by him. So we gotta allow God to be the one who sets the definition of right, and sets the definition of just. And that's got to be where we take our cues from. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. And I will tell you, if there is a war being waged on who's more mad and therefore more right, the Democrats are winning. I told you this is not going to get political, but this is from the DNC platform We must right the wrongs in our democracy, redress the systemic injustices that have long plagued our society, throw open the doors of opportunity for all Americans, reinvent our institutions at home and our leadership abroad. And so they're tapping into a perceived sense of injustice and they're getting people stirred up emotionally in anger to do something about it. Now, I could pick on the Republicans, too. They didn't even write a new platform. I opened up the 2020 platform. It's from 2016. I'm like, they're mad at Obama still. That's not going to win any votes, everybody. Can we do some work around here, Republicans? And so we can pick on whoever. But we get people in a rage, and oftentimes, we can insert a solution to a problem we haven't even evaluated if it's right or true or just. And let's not be the people that do that. You're going to hear a lot about justice if you're not already Social justice, reparative justice, restorative justice, racial justice. There's all sorts of modifiers to this concept of justice, and with them come a solution to a perceived problem or a perceived injustice. But we've yet to even stop to ask ourselves what our definition of justice is. So you have that compiled with the fact that you can almost not see injustice from other people's perspective, and an inability to communicate because we're all so angry We are not postured to do well as a country. Do you know that? You know, my biggest concern as a pastor is when I imagine half of Americans after election day, no matter who's elected, there's going to be about half of our country ticked. And I really don't know how people are going to act at this point. It could be ugly. It could just be a different group of people being stupid and angry. So I don't know what to expect. But as the church of Jesus, I can tell you that we have a very clear definition of justice. And it's not limited to one set of perspectives or another. Because if we're tapping into God's perspective and we're having God's view on justice, it is one that does not clearly fit into party lines. It is not one that is clearly served by one course of action or another. And it leads us to evaluate very complex situations with wisdom that only God can give. I'll lead you briefly through justice as a theme in scripture. It starts in Genesis, it ends in Revelation, and it reveals the nature of God in his justice. And it begins, 
Obviously, there's some injustice when Adam and Eve believe a lie about God and they disobey him and they're cast out of the Garden of Eden. There's, there's elements where you could pull out justice or injustice. But it really begins in chapter 4, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 to 8, in the story of Cain and Abel. Read with me in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 4. In the course of time, Cain, Adam and Eve's first son, brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. So he's religious. He's compelled to to serve and, and, and love God and bring an offering. Verse four, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And so his brother does likewise following his example and does so of the best of what he has to offer. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, presumably because it was the best of the best, whereas Cain's was just some. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very what? angry because of a perceived injustice. Typical firstborn, by the way. I, I, I'm the one that thought of this, and you're going to give him the credit? This is my idea. And why don't you like my stuff? You, you're, uh, you like, like fruit or, or, or meat? I don't know. What is God's preference here? How do I figure you out? And so Cain becomes indignant. He becomes angry because he feels like he's been treated un. Fairly, unjustly. Do you see that? And his face fell, verse six. And the Lord said to Cain, can I just pause there and say, isn't it awesome to be able to see a God that still speaks to and moves towards angry people? Yes. Even people that are angry at him, yes. even people who are accusing him of being unjust. It's the Lord that said to Cain, God's always moving in our direction and we ought to do the same. Why are you angry and why has your face fallen? Let's consider the source of this response, Cain. If you do well, will you not be accepted? He's saying, this isn't about me not expect, accepting your gift. This is about you not giving me the best. You're coming to me with an offering that says that I'm God and you're not. You're trying to make a statement that I'm, I'm God. And yet you're only bringing me some stuff, some leftovers. Do you see this? He says, this is actually on you. You want to know what God's perspective of justice is? He goes, Cain, you're not all in, buddy. You're, you're, you're being fake and phony and, and religious. This is, um, this is the guilt money that I don't like. When, when I was first pastoring a church, um, we, we had an offering baskets. Most churches have baskets and buckets. I always give them a hard time. Buckets, baskets, boots, hats, and the velvet bags with the gold handles, those freak me out, but... <laughs> But I know everybody does the collection, and we don't have a collection. And um, I, that was one of the first things I wanted to do in the church that I was leading. I was like, I want to lose the baskets. We are a church that's here to give to our community and not to take. I want everybody that comes to Christ Church for the first time, it wasn't called Christ Church, that comes to our church for the first time, I don't want them to feel like we're asking them for anything. And so I want to get rid of the baskets and put boxes on the wall. And everybody freaked. And uh, one of the things they said was like, the offering's going to plummet. No one's going you know, no to give if you don't put the basket in front of them. And I was like, I don't want their guilt money. And I know what that's like. I've been to other people's church. You put $3 in your pocket in case that basket comes by, you have something to stick in there, right? And then the basket, no basket, they're going to keep their $3. I'm like, keep it. And this is what God is saying about Cain's offering. He's saying, you're posing, dude. That's the source of your problem. And so here we have God's angle on the injustice is not the same as Cain's. Just because he's angry doesn't make him right. If you do well, will you not be accepted? I want you. I want, to be your, I want to be your God. I want you to be my person. This is just not how this gets done. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you or for you, but you must rule over it. Verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And here we're introduced to the atrocity of murder and the beginning of injustice on the earth. And one more powerful person or group oppresses another and destroys and acts against and uses their might and their influence and their power to push down and to hurt and to destroy. This is the work of the enemy, and this is a picture of humanity's injustice. And judgment's coming. God said to Cain, your brother's blood cries out from the ground. And so God's ju final judgment is coming. Everybody gets what they deserve in the end. I don't know if you know this or not. For those of us who are in Christ, he has borne away what we deserve. And the only reason we will stand forgiven is because we have a substitute. Do you know that? 
but judgment is coming for all people. And this is the clear teaching from Psalm 2. It is the backbone of all of God's fairness and equity and judgment. And this is where this idea of justice as a theme comes from in Scripture. You know that the, the world got so violent by Genesis chapter 6 that God regretted making man on the earth and decided to destroy the whole thing. And he only changes his mind from destroying all of humanity because he had made a promise through the curse to the serpent, to Eve, that the, her offspring would have final victory. And so he preserved humanity through one family, Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives, and through a global flood brought judgment and yet saved Noah by grace as he revealed to him what God was gonna do. And then through faith, as Noah responded in obedience and built the ark, and now we have humanity starting over. And in Genesis chapter nine, God resets and restarts with the same commands he had given to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, It said two times in chapter 9, in brackets, the justice of God, which is a new revelation. It says, look at this in verse 5 of Genesis 9. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. And from every beast, I will require it. And from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of a man. Whoever sheds the blood of man By man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. And here we have established the value of human life, and we have instituted the death penalty, death for death. Now, this is a ministry of death, but it is a ministry of justice. What does it do? When someone takes a human life, it is said that that life had value, and therefore, that value must be met. If I was to purposefully back over your childhood pet and then offer you in my condolences a check for $5.78, would that feel equitable or just? No. And here God is establishing the value of a person by the outcome of justice, life for life. He'll fill this out in the law given to Israel, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, that the punishment must fit the crime. This means justice must be commensurate to the offense. And so if you get in a fight and punch somebody in the face and break, break their skull and put out their eye, buckle up, here comes your left hook, right? Now this is justice in Israel's law. And yet we're living, we live in a world where we're more familiar with concepts from Gandhi and the like, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind, right? And we love mercy, I, I mentioned the sense of justice we have when somebody flies past us in traffic at a high rate of speed, and then you get up ahead and find them pulled over, and you're like, ha ha, we all love justice. And yet, when we get pulled over, and we give all our reasons for our rate of speed, it was this, and it was this, and this, and I didn't see, and, and then we experience mercy. We go, oh, that, that was better. And so we love mercy. And yet here we have to establish justice through the punishment And this is what God does for all people in this Noahic covenant. Now, the storyline continues as the darkest part of Israel's history, the book of Judges. How many of you guys have read through the Bible in a year? Raise your hand. Be bold. If you've not, it's worth doing. Um, If you're having your children begin to read the Bible like I am, my Evie is 11. She's reading the Bible cover to cover. I have asked her not to read the book of Judges. I don't want her to read the book of Judges um, not, not only because I don't want to answer the questions she's going to have after reading the book of Judges, um, but it's violence. It's the, it's the darkest part of the Bible. And the epitaph that is repeated again and again and again through Judges is this, seen in 17 verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eye. And so it's important that we recognize the value of God-instituted human government. I am pro-government, by the way. You want to know the worst type of experience you can have as a human? Anarchy. When everyone decides what's right and does what they want, that's a terrible place to live. Can I get amen? And so government is good, and judges is a polemic for that. There was no king. There was no government. Everyone did what was right, and what happens in the book of Judges is atrocious. See, I got all your teenagers to go home and read the Bible. You're welcome. (laughs) And so we follow the storyline of the establishment of a king in Saul, who goes south and turns from God. In David, a man after God's own heart, and yet a man of bloodshed and war, 
who makes some serious mistakes, ultimately culminating in the promised son of David, Solomon. And here Solomon displays for us what a good king looks like. Do you guys know the Solomon story? So God, David told God, I'm going to build you a house, physically a temple. And God told David, no, I'm going to build you a house, a family, a lineage. And there's going to be a son of yours that will sit on the throne and rule forever. And his, his, uh, his reign will have no end. And so then David has a son, Solomon, who turns out to be the best king Israel had ever seen. In fact, the best king the world had ever seen. Um, I'd almost I'd rather live in a world that is, has a king over it that's just um, than sometimes a democracy. I mean, democracies only work for upright and moral people. Do you know that? I don't know how many of you guys would like to be in a democracy on an island inhabited solely by pirates. <laughs> you know, we all say you die, so you die, right? <laughs> like, that doesn't sound great. Right? You like my hook. <laughs> and, so, and so here's Solomon. Now Solomon becomes king when he's young, and the thing he has going for him is he's humble. That's the thing he has going for him. Before anything else, he goes, I don't know what I'm doing. This is a big job, and no one could do this well. And in fact, one of the first things he does is a huge mistake. He makes a marriage agreement with the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, and he marries his daughter, which would have been a no-no. God did not want him to do that. And so God comes to him and he says, ask me for anything and I'll give it to you. You guys know the story. What does he ask for? Wisdom and understanding. And God says, oh, that was the right thing to ask for. I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give you all the other stuff that everybody else would have asked for. And then there's a story in 1 Kings chapter 3 that illustrates the wisdom that Solomon has. Maybe you're familiar with the story. Two prostitutes come to Solomon with a case that is unsolvable. Each of them had given birth to a baby within days of each other, and early in the life cycle of these babies, one of these prostitutes, the, the baby died in her bed, and then she took the baby from the other prostitute, and now there's a custody battle between two prostitutes over whose baby this is. And in his wisdom, Solomon says, I, I can fix this. Bring me a sword. We'll divide the baby in half and give each of them half. And he says this to each woman in private, and the woman who did not, was not the rightful mother of the child said, fine, that's, that's a good solution. But the woman who was the mother of the child said, by no means give her the child. Why? Because her impulse was to protect the child, not to gain for herself. And in this act of wisdom, Solomon was able to show his amazing wisdom. And the people marveled at it. And it is marvelous, isn't it? Yeah. You think about that? But if you stop for one second and consider this only a, a little bit deeper, do you know that in that time period for two prostitutes fighting over a baby born in a brothel to who knows who? The question is not whose baby is it? The question to everyone would be, who cares? These are throwaway people with a throwaway problem. Why are we bothering the king with this question? That would have been the cultural response. And think about it for just a second. Prostitutes fighting over a baby. But listen, what we see pictured in God's good king is a picture of God himself. He cares about every person created in the image of God, no matter what terrible workforce they've been forced into, no matter what situation they're in. He cares deeply about every single person, and he gives, he gives voice to every single person's problem. He listens to every single prayer, and he will act for justice for every person on the planet. Do you see it? He's not only wise, but he's good and he's kind. And this is what Solomon was. He got into what nobody would care about and just pushed out of their courts. He took it on for himself, not just to show justice, what it really looked like, but to show the very heart of God, that everyone matters to God, even prostitutes with dead babies. You see this? So here's the key verse, and I'll start my descent here. Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I Delight, declares the Lord. Now take this apart with me for just a second. Here's the thing about the human condition. Every one of us 
at some point in our adolescence, steps into the process of self-justifying. We become aware of ourselves. Remember the first time you felt insecure about something? Do you remember the happiness of childhood when you didn't care about anything? Do you remember the first time you noticed that you were ugly? <laughs> now, I know there's some beautiful people in the room, but I'm saying there was a point in time where you were ugly. Like, you went from this little kid to this awkward adult, and, like, your face was small, but your nose got big, and your ears stuck out, and you were covered in bumps all over your face, and your teeth were all funny. Remember that? Do you remember the first time you looked in the mirror, and you were like, oh, my God, I'm ugly. <laughs> and you immediately started trying to do stuff to be less ugly, hairstyles and face scrubs and high collars and whatever it took to try to minimize the ugliness. Remember that feeling? I'm sorry if that's some of you right now. We all went through it. We did. We all experienced it. And when that happens, that kind of self-actualization begins. And what do we start doing? We start grasping for our own strengths. Well, well, I'm funny. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I can talk good. Well, I have, a, I, I'm a, I have a good personality. Well, I'm really good at this one thing. I'm, I excel at this. And we start playing to our own strengths, don't we? And then in order to feel good about ourselves, because we're good at basketball, now we're part of the basketball team. And those are our people. And forget the football players and the nerds over here and those gothic kids. That the, we don't want to associate with them. And what do we do? In order to feel better about us, we individualize, self-justify, and then we tribalize. We find our people so that we can feel better about us, don't we? And religious people do it. Sometimes religious people are the throwaways. We don't fit in any group, and so we just hang out with each other. <laughs> because they'll let anybody come to church, right? There's even a group for you. <laughs> Nobody likes me. We have a group for that. <laughs> and so here we all are, trying to like self-promote and, and trying to find meaning and value. And, and here God's speaking through the prophet saying, listen, so you don't have a lot going on, but you got some money. Don't, don't boast in your money. So you're super insecure, but you're strong. Don't, don't boast in your might. So you're, you, you're oh, yeah, but you're smart. Don't boast in your wisdom. You don't, you don't need, you don't need to self-justify. You know why? Because God says, they're created in my image. And after my likeness, you're made by God on purpose. And he wants you that way. Do you know that? And so you don't need to find a group of people that make you feel better about you. If you're going to boast in anything, boast in that you know God. And when you know God, what you will know him to be, he is just. But notice what always accompanies the justice of God. He practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, and in these things he delights. We're gonna forego our last worship song because I wanna finish this concept. And I'll just finish preaching, pray, and close, but think about this for a second. So much of the problem we have in our country today is that people are beginning with their predetermined set of rights and then demanding justice without ever actually evaluating if the thing they call a right is actually right to God. Do you understand? And also, so many of the rights that we are fighting vigorously to defend are really nothing more than self-justifications to give us value and dignity when we don't need to fight for that. So much of the issues surrounding gender fluidity and sexual orientation is a vicious fight because same-sex attracted people or gender-fluid people feel the need to demand that they are treated equally like everybody else so that I have value for who I am. And here I'm here to tell you, before, before anything about you is sexual or gender-based, you are made in God's image. Do you know that? And he didn't make a mistake. Jesus said in Matthew 19, he created very clear paradigms for human sexuality. He said there's two categories for sexuality to God, married, heterosexual marriage and monogamous, or single and celibate, and that's it. He said that very clearly, and the people were like, well, then who, who can do that? And that was their question. That would be your question. Some of you are asking that right now. You're like, that was what I was going to ask. <laughs> and you know, what, you know what Jesus said? He said, 
the, the term he uses, eunuch, in English, it's a confusing term, but it essentially means gender ambiguous or genderless. He said there are eunuchs who were born eunuchs. They were born not binary. He says there's those who are made eunuchs by man. That means castrated or given hysterectomy so that they can't produce. And now they're, they're, they have no, they're no longer sexual beings. And that happened to them. Someone did that to them in violence so that for, as a slave. And he said there's also those who make themselves celibate unto God. They're single unto God. Those three categories Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 19. And he says each of those essentially is a gift and a calling. And you have to receive them from God. Which means that God makes a way for you to live by his standard of righteousness. But you will be judged by his standard and not yours. Do you understand that? And so God's justice is always accompanied by righteousness. And brothers and sisters, he's the definer of what's right, not you. And we could apply this to any difficult situation. When we're demanding that our rights be defended before we've evaluated if the right we're claiming is God's right or not, we're set for a fight that can't be won. Notice also that God's justice is always accompanied by steadfast love. And this is where I got to tell you, you don't want any other king than King Jesus. There is no king, there is no president, there is no politician, there is no person that you can ever look to that will be able to lead you and guide you and guard you and protect you and give you justice except Jesus. Because the only one that puts around justice both righteousness and steadfast love. And I love the picture of Solomon and the prostitutes because he welcomed them to his table to hear their case. What more loving thing could a king do for two hookers than listen to the thing that matters the most to them as they fight over this baby? And he was able to execute justice. And this is the heart of God. He cares about every single person. He doesn't care what you've done. He doesn't care what's been done to you. He doesn't care where you're hurt. He doesn't care where you're mad. He doesn't care where you're wrong. He wants you, and he always moves in your direction to bring you justice and to bring you salvation. Isn't that beautiful? Listen, there is an an absence of steadfast love in the debates that are raging in our world today. Do you know that? Everybody's fighting about just, my definition of just, My rights, no, my rights. Your rights infringe upon my rights. And they do, and they never will stop. The question is, what is right to God? And in the meantime, will we be people who allow Jesus to transform our heart so that despite people being wrong, they can still be loved and loved by us? This is why I'm so proud of our Crisis Pregnancy Center's Resources for Women, Grace House, because they're helping women navigate a legal choice they have to terminate their pregnancies, abort their babies, to commit what God would call the murder of a human life. And they're allowed to, it's legal. And yet their approach is not to tell them what they ought to do, to tell them to do the right thing or else, to bend their will or to judge them, but they show them steadfast love and tender mercy. And they give them the reasons why there's another alternative and they offer support and help. Do you understand what is on the line here? Listen, justice will be had. Jesus will return and serve as the standard by which every human that has ever lived will be judged. And if you are in him, then it's his righteousness that's your standard and the source of your salvation and eternal life. Isn't that good news? And yet, the one who is the righteous judge is the steadfast, loving one. And this ought to be what every person that calls himself a Jesus follower looks like as we engage in the hard work of justice. Listen, we're straddling two very different worlds. We're living in a world where politically when we engage, we are becoming part of lawmaking that imposes a morality, a righteousness on everyone for the good of the whole. And that's your obligation as an American citizen, if you're of age. But you also live in the world of the kingdom of heaven that is established by Jesus, that is meant to declare what is true with steadfast love, with an offer of foreign righteousness to whoever would receive it. Isn't that amazing? And this was the plan of God through all of time. Man, I miss the days when church was two hours long. I will, as, as long as half of you volunteer for Christchurch Kids next week, I will do it. <laughs> if, you, if you join the, the teachers. 
Let me just close here. You guys are familiar with Isaiah 53. It talks about Jesus' sacrifice and the death of Jesus, the suffering servant. Maybe you're not as familiar with Isaiah 59. This is where God looks into a world filled with injustice, and then he does something about it. I want to read it to you as we close. Verse 14. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away. Truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. So judgment is coming. And, verse 20, and a redeemer will come to Zion. As for me, God says, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression. Do you know that there's a place you can run with all your injustice intact, with all of your rage and anger and atrocity, with all, of, with all the bitterness that this world has delivered to you? There's a place that you can turn for escape, for salvation, for restoration, for reparation. There's only one place that you can truly be whole, and that is to the arms of the Redeemer that God has sent, and his name is Jesus. He is the righteous standard by which all men will give an account. He is the, he is the, the lens by which we understand God's word and establish righteousness. It is what influences our vote, and it is what tempers our love as we speak truth to the world that needs it. And it is the only source of justice that you will find. And so I urge you to turn to him and let him forgive your transgressions. I urge you to let him define justice with righteousness and steadfast love. Amen. God, we thank you that despite these topics being complex and a nation that rages trying to figure them out. God, we thank you that you have embodied justice in Jesus, that you have shown us steadfast love and righteousness. God, as we navigate very difficult issues in our culture, in our legal system, and in this election, God, I pray that we would do so with steadfast love, with a disposition to allow you to define right before we demand our rights. And God, I pray that you would work in your people that we might, with you, bring about the justice that pleases you on the earth in our generation. God, we thank you for the government and the state, and we pray for our leaders in all, all levels of government. And God, we thank you for the church, for the kingdom of Jesus that can do what governments cannot to change the human heart. Lord, we are yours and have your way in our heart and mind. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys. It only gets trickier, so buckle up for next week. We'll see you then. <laughs>